Welcome to a webinar brought to you by the Nazarian Center for Israel Studies at UCLA. Uh, like everyone else, we are operating uh, remotely uh, at the moment. The spring quarter at UCLA has just begun. Classes are taking place online. And uh, the Nazarian Center is trying to continue to function uh, under the uh, circumstances brought by the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. Um, we would, didn't want to cancel any of the planned events that we had for uh, this spring quarter. So instead, we've tried to move all our programming online um, in the form of podcasts and webinars. And this is our very first uh, live webinar. Um, and we're delighted uh, for this very first webinar to be joined by Ayelet Harel Shalev, um, who is an associate professor at the Conflict Management and Resolution Program in the Department of Politics and government at Ben Gurion University and was a previous uh, visiting scholar at the Nazarian uh, Center for Israel Studies. So we're delighted that she could uh, join us uh, for this uh, webinar. I'm particularly grateful uh, given the time difference Ayelet is in Israel. And so we're aware that it's uh, late in the evening there. So we're really thankful uh, for you for joining us. Uh, Harel Shalev is the author of the book, The Challenge of Democracy, Citizenship, Rights and Ethnic Conflicts in India and Israel, which was published by Cambridge University Press in 2013. And most recently, she is the co-author along with Shir Daphne Tokoa of the book, Breaking the Binaries in Security Studies, A Gendered Perspective of Women in Conflict, which was published just this year by Oxford University Press. Uh, it's an excellent book, I, I strongly recommend it. And here to talk to us about the book and answer your questions specifically about uh, women in combat and Israeli women in the IDF. Um, I'm very uh, delighted to introduce our speaker today, Ayelet Harel Shalev. Thank you so much, Dov. Uh, I'm so happy to be here. Um, I wish I could be there in person, in person, but it will happen in a few months, I hope. Um, so today I will uh, present a short talk about um, our co-authored book, uh, which discuss security studies and women in combat. And I think uh, the talk will be about 25 minutes and afterwards there'll be um, an opportunity to ask questions and we'll have some discussion. So let's start. The 1990s saw women beginning to feel a wider range of roles in the military, with bans on women serving in combat roles being gradually relaxed in some countries. As a result, women are able to fly combat aircraft, serve in artillery units, staff missile emplacement, serve as combat medics, and fill various other roles that involve potential combat exposure. Additionally, many more women are being assigned to combat support roles located on the front line. Yet today, about three decades after the start of these changes, most research on women involved in the military life still concern itself with wife and enlisted men, women in civilian posts within the military, women that were sexually assaulted in the military, or women in non-combat related military service. It is thus obvious that women combatants who fulfill assignments in conflict zones and who participate in various armed struggles deserve close attention in the research arena. Now, within the larger debate on military conscription, the dominant gender images of war have been relatively fixed for centuries. Men are the militarist, women are the pacifists or victims. Men are the warriors marching into battle, whereas women march for peace. Now, um, when women are involved in the battlefield, their contribution is typically underestimated or underdocumented. In light of this context, the experiences of Israeli women combatants draw our attention and sparked our curiosity. So I will open with one of the clearest examples about binary conceptions in the military and in the sphere of security studies. Several months after Operation Protective Edge, the 2014 Israeli operation in Gaza Strip, 53 Israel Defense Force combatants and combat support soldiers were awarded military decorations for exhibiting extraordinary bravery. From a gender perspective, 
The most noteworthy aspect of these awards was not the fact that only four of the recipients were women, but rather the difference between the justification for the awards given to men and those for women. Men soldiers were uniformly praised for being brave, for actively performing acts of bravery, for protecting, and so on. But the women combatants were commended mainly for not panicking. One of the women soldiers who had reportedly spotted armed terrorists trying to infiltrate an Israeli kibbutz was praised for not panicking and immediately informing her commanders. Yes, you heard right. Another woman soldier was said to have identified 13 terrorists emerging from a tunnel and similarly did not panic. Thus, with respect to gender, the language of this citation obviously reinforced existing norms. Praiseworthy men combat soldiers are those who show their strong and active nature through acts of bravery, while praiseworthy women combat soldiers are those who overcome their weak and hysterical nature by not panicking. This pattern is not unique to the Israeli case. It reflects the patriarchal norms that still prevail in military institutions worldwide. One might have expected that so many years after the entry of women into the battlefield as combatants, some of the gender norms informing militaries would have come under considerable strain. However, women in the military still face a double battle against the state's purported enemies and against the patriarchal and masculine nature of the military. Now, the binary between hysterical women and brave men is not the only binary conception that exists in the research arena of conflict, violence, and the military. There are binary conceptions in the study of security, in the study of trauma, in the study of protection, and in the study of violence. It was these binary conceptions that sparked our curiosity and led us to embark the current research while presenting the ex-combatants as narrators that are telling their own story about their military service. One of the first binary conceptions that we explore is the heated debate among scholars, including feminist scholars, regarding the meaning of women's participation in the military. In fact, Women's struggle for equal participation in the military is often criticized. Many scholars hold the view that the struggle for equality in the military has negative side effects, including the possibilities of reinforcing militarism, encouraging militarization of women's life, and even bringing about legitimization of the use of force. Some people claim that women should be, first of all, fighting for peace and for justice, and only later take care of equality in the military, if at all. And then, yet again, decide for women what they should or shouldn't do. Additionally, some observers even claim that the integration of women into the military, and particularly into combat roles, has feminizing and weakening effect on military units. In Israel, some religious groups opposed to incorporation of women to combat units as well, adding more reservations to the discussion. On the other hand, other scholars think that women should integrate into the military in order to gain equality and equal status, as in other spheres of life since military service is one of the most distinctive symbol of full citizenship, just as the service of men in the military often translates into many formal and informal rights in their civilian life, so the exclusion of women might diminish their civic status. Yet, irrespective of the academic and the ideological debate, since women are indeed currently serving in a variety of combat roles and combat support positions in many countries around the globe, our position is that there is much to be learned from this phenomena about the gendered elements of military service and about gender power relations in general. Now, one of the pillars of our book is its presentation of the narratives of women combatants. But the book also moves beyond the narratives to offer different perspectives on theoretical questions. Why is it important to explore women in combat? What do their experiences teach us? 
What is the meaning of referring to soldiers and veterans both as citizens and as violent state actors? When do women soldiers and veterans actively express their voices and when do they silence them? What is the meaning of women's service as combat soldiers for the larger polity and society? We address these questions by exploring the stories of 100 women who served in combat roles in the Israeli Defense Force. Now, let us examine shortly the socio-political context of the book. This is provided by Israeli society. The Israeli society perceives war and preparation for war as unavoidable processes. Military service for Israeli women became mandatory soon after the creation of the State of Israel in 1948, and women comprise one third of the military personnel. Exemptions are given to Arab women and to ultra-Orthodox women. Plus, when a woman is getting married, she is no longer obligated to serve in mandatory service. She can continue to serve, but it is not mandatory. This rule does not apply to men. In addition, while military service in Israel is compulsory for both women and men, women's service in combat roles is voluntary. Women have had to struggle for the right to join combat unit, and uh, it was a long struggle. And um, combat service for women is considered far more prestigious than traditional feminine administrative military roles. Nonetheless, women in combat roles remain the exception rather than the rule, and Israel lags behind other nations in this respect. I'll give you some numbers. In 2015, only 3% of women soldiers served in combat positions, uh, whereas in 2020, about 8% of the women in the military are serving in combat units, and the numbers are continuing to rise. Much more are serving in combat support positions. Now, our book does not delve directly into the predicament of the Israeli society or into the Israel-Palestinian conflict, the occupation, or the Israel-Arab conflict per se, but the, rather focuses on the narration of the experiences of women ex-combatants in the Israel Defense Force. Well, these conflicts are always in the background of their experiences. We sought to present their formative experience during the military service and their perspectives in their military afterlives as civilians in a heavily militarized society. Now, if I'd like to tell you a little bit about the, the research itself and the participants, the women included in our study have been drafted into the army at about the age of 18 and had volunteered for their combat or combat support roles. The women all served as combatants for a number of years, but they did not pursue military careers. At the time of the interviews, all have been released from their service, but some of these women veterans were still serving in reserve forces. More than 70% of all roles in the IDF are open to female candidates. Our interviewees served in various positions. All interviewees had served on one of Israel's fronts, borders, or at the checkpoints on the borders between Israel and the West Bank, the Gaza Strip, Lebanon, or Syria, or in war rooms located near the borders. All the interviewees has been exposed to various manifestations of the violent armed conflict between Israel and its neighbors. 50 of the interviewed veterans have served in direct combat roles and the other 50 in combat support roles. Now, um, each chapter of the book focuses on one of the main topics that were dominant in the interviewees' stories. Violence and state violence, trauma and combat trauma, gender, voice and silence, sexual harassment, and more. In this short talk today, I will discuss topics that are related to gender and the combatants' actions and struggle to integrate into the hierarchic masculine organization. I will sum up with general comments about the findings in this matter. Okay. So let us share some examples from their experiences and then discuss them a bit. 
During the interviews, the soldiers frequently emphasize their capabilities and their ability to act during warfare and their ability to protect others during combat. For example, Adina, a combat medic, shared with us her experiences of evacuating bodies of dead soldiers under fire in one of Israel's operation in Gaza. She says, in these situations, you disconnect yourself. Now, when I look back, I can see myself doing all these things as if I were outside my body. My role as a combat paramedic during the military service involved technical staff. Except treating wounded soldiers, I had to lift the dead body, prop it up and hold it until we reached the Israeli border. There is no one else who can do this. You, can, you need to get the corpses out now. Otherwise, imagine what would happen to the soldier if they saw their friend burned. It's horrible. The goal was to get the bodies out as fast as we could, no matter with which car, no matter how. I did it for the soldier. They shouldn't see their friends dead. We transferred the bodies like a sack, move the body and move on. In addition to her emphasis on the doing, and her need to disconnect in order to function under severe stress and to cope with danger and trauma, Adina's war narrative also sheds new light on the issue of protection. Sigal, a combatant officer, continues. She says, We had alerts in the base ab about a terrorist invasion. My soldiers were kept a meter away and kept calling me on the radio, screaming and yelling. They were on duty, but they were not combat soldiers. The women soldiers called me, completely hysterical, telling me that they were hiding under the table. It was completely surreal. So there was sirens all around, and I had no idea where the terrorist was going to come out from. My room was the next to the floor that connects the passage to the Gaza Strip. I said, Shema Israel, open the door with my weapon and run like there is no tomorrow from my room to the soldier's room to protect them. It's interesting to see how the combat soldiers position themselves as opposed to other soldiers, eager to protect both combat soldiers and non-combat soldiers. Now, protection is a central theme in security studies. Identities of men as protectors and women as protected afford women and men differing access to power and decision-making in the state. As constructed historically, the state's primary, primary duty is the protection of the population from foreign threats, a task carried out, usually, by men through the rules of designated military service. Women have thus become a second-class citizens. Nonetheless, they are expected to be loyal, obedient, and grateful to their protectors, and they are also expected to take in on the role of the carers. The narratives of the women soldiers interviewed in this book project clearly indicates that while they do indeed express care, they themselves viewed their actions as protection, as opposed to feminine care or masculine protection. Thus, the women soldiers themselves broke the care protector binary. The act of protection was dominant in their narrative. Let's move on. The weapon occupied a substantial place in the interviewee's recollections. In her description of a tense moment of combat, Noah, a combat sniper, struggled to describe a sense of something like acceleration from the complex and powerful situation. I look through the rifle sight, and I don't know if you can imagine this. It is aiming a rifle sight on a human being, and a bullet is in the barrel. You understand that in that moment, you are holding life in your hands. And it sounds strange. It sounds heroic. It sounds like a movie, but this is the reality. It is this moment that I cannot describe. It is just a kind of emotion, an emotion of... Now, most combatants indicate that they sense that the weapon was a part of their bodies. 
They felt well-trained and capable and ready to perform difficult tasks that including hurting the other, although refrained from discussing it directly. I have many more examples of these experiences. Echoing the topic of the body of the female combatant, the interviewees also noted ways in which the military was not ready for women's bodies. They described that the equipment is not always suited to their anatomy. While while several militaries are currently working to design and produce gender specific gear, but this process is still far from complete and it is a burning issue. Alongside the description of an unsuitable military gear, the women often reflected about what it means to be a woman in the military and what it means to be feminine in the military. Tal described with frustration the process that she went through. She said, after the entire process of combat training, I became a man. As a combatant, I'm not a strong woman, but a kind of a weak man. Noah, for example, reflected on the complex nature of femininity and masculinity in the military as she understood it. How can I be feminine here in the military service? If I look like a man, I behave like a man, I crawl like a man, then am I a woman? So you notice an effort. When they go home for the weekend, some women combat soldiers put on earrings and makeup as if it was a feminine experience. I want to develop just a minute, a different perception of what it means to be feminine. To be feminine doesn't necessarily mean to be gentle or to wear makeup. To be feminine, for me, is to be strong, to be protective, to be supportive of others. Maybe this is what feminine means, so I give it, the femininity, a different meaning. Noah's view contrasts uh, in an interesting way with Tal's comment mentioned earlier to the effect that in the army she became a weak man rather than a strong woman. Tal's view echoes the theoretical debate about gender which presumed that to act like a soldier is not to be womanly. The women soldiers who we interviewed grapple with the question of their gendered identity as combatants. They display different and often ambivalent attitudes toward the question of how they ought to have behaved, behaved as women in the military and also how they were perceived. And while each of the women we interviewed held her own particular interpretation of the role she ought to have assumed as a combatant, all the interviewees acknowledged that the system demanded they will become more masculine. Another aspect of the women's combatants' integration to combat roles was related to how men in the same roles treated them. Alongside with descriptions of men combatants who did indeed support the women combatants, a recurring theme in the interviews related to men soldiers who disregarded and underestimated the women in combat, expressed their discomfort with women officers and with women in combat roles. Tal, a combat uh, a combatant, described a double standard applied to women and men combatants. When you're tough, you're considered a bitch. You're not considered strong. No, you're a bitch. Whereas a man who behave in the same way, everyone says, what a man. But you, you're just a whore. Rotem, a combatant, adds to that, and spoke about her frustration when men are picked for certain operational role instead of her. I was very successful in a physical training. I was ranked second in everything, except for one guy. I was ahead of all of the guys. Yet, when there was a security operation, they picked the guys and not me. I was frustrated. I'm talented, I'm athletic, I shoot well, and I'm not appreciated enough. The ex-combatants admitted that they encountered the same double standards in civilian life as well. In the book, we expose a wide spectrum of interpretation of what it means to be a woman combatant and how the women in combat roles coped with these dilemmas. Now, um, let's talk a little bit about their transition to civil life. 
War and military service are acknowledged in the literature as enabling the young male to become a man. What then is war for the combat women? Following this line of thought, one should ask, what can we say about the so-called reverse process of becoming a civilian again? What is the nature of this process for women veterans? The narratives of the combat women about their discharge from the military and subsequent transitioning to civilian life varied from interviewee to interviewee. A substantial number of the women veterans told us that they moved naturally, occasionally with some minor shock, into their civilian lives upon completing their mandatory service. The fact that the majority of Israeli young adults, women and men alike, follow a similar path might serve as a supporting mechanism for these veterans. Um, while the overwhelming majority of interviewees expressed the feeling that their military service have been positive experience, some nuances of difficulties could be read between the lines. As the women combat soldiers who we interviewed repeatedly emphasize, when they re-enter civilian life, even for a weekend break from the military service, they struggled with patriarchal norms, even though they carried with them their war experiences and they were well aware of their capabilities. I'll give you some examples. Adina, an ex-combatant, recounted the following exchange with her father after she told him about her involvement in an operational activity very deep in an enemy territory. My dad told me, how did he let you do that? I don't believe they let my daughter do that. And I said to him, what do you mean let me? I chose to do that. He was very upset that I went into the battlefield into enemy territory during an operation. I told him, what about my brother and my cousins? They also went into enemy territory. My father replied, no, it's not the same. It's not the same. Adina was certain that she is the best candidate to do this dangerous job, but her father disregarded her abilities. Many combatants shared that others were surprised and skeptical about their involvement in combat. We gained a different perspective from Susanna's reflection on her service. She said, I am a combatant. It is, in my view, proof that I can do anything in civilian life. Since if I did this, is there anything I cannot do? Until today, I'm very proud of this. I wouldn't change it for the world. Now to conclude, our research, um, the book by Shilda Fnatko and myself on the double battle faced by women combatants in a conflict zone as soldiers and as women illustrate the complexities of their status. In the narratives, the women describe the moral complexities of their service and in particular, the problematics of serving in a military that controls a civilian population. And into this complex situation, gender elements entered. The women in combat roles reported having to face gender stereotypes, resistance, and sometimes mockery from their male counterparts during their service. In this short talk, I have the opportunity to present a tiny piece of our findings. In the book itself, we elaborate much more about each theme. Returning to the deconstruction of binary conceptions, we take the position that women should be viewed as capable and vital actors in armed conflict rather than merely passive victims. Likewise, soldiers and veterans should not be described as either pacifist or militarist. There are many perspectives along this continuing. Our study opens a call for scholars to probe further into the meanings and interpretations of women's presence in today's battlefield. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ayelet. That was uh, that was really fascinating and a wonderful uh, summary of your excellent book. Um, I want to begin by asking one of, th one of the things that I thought was such a, a strength of the book was the way that you uh, brought so many different voices into into the subject instead of really 
uh, you know, allowing these these various so, uh, former soldiers to speak for themselves, um, and and sometimes they they contradicted each other. There wasn't kind of you weren't really trying to push a single narrative, if you like. Um, to begin with, I, I wonder, as uh, you and your co-author are Israeli Jewish women yourselves, did that afford you? the ability, the kind of access and the ability to reach these subjects in a way that may not have been possible otherwise. How did you, how did your own kind of subject position in this come into play in your, in your research process? Well, I think um, your question is excellent. And I think the, the whole issue of um, being not just an Israeli, but also feminist, and not just Israeli and feminist, God forbid, leftist. And while we have our own perspectives on the conflict about uh, the subject, we wanted to explore this issue in the best way that we can. And we want to give a chance for the soldiers to speak for themselves. And you know, I think we have many, many elements here that get into the, the way. For instance, um, as a scholar, when I say to other academics that I study women activists for peace, then, or for activists for gender equality, the response is typically one of enthusiasm and great interest. However, when indicating that we also research women combatants in the Israel Defense Force, we are aware of discomfort, reluctant to engage in discourse, and even anger. And I think that the, this dichotomy that led us to reflect on how scholars can be critical without being exclusionary. And I think that narratives are always political. I mean, who deserves our attention and our ear and our empathy and who does not? Choosing to listen to one narrative and not the other is a political act. So in this context, I think that our multidisciplinary approach allows us to call into question widely accepted definitions within our disciplines, political science and trauma studies on the other hand, regarding, for example, who is a victim and who is a survival, who should be termed as a combatant and whose security is being guaranteed. And um, I think that looking at the soldiers as both being on the stronger side of the conflict, let's say, but also in power relations within the military was very, very interesting for us. And the influence of the narratives on us as women, feminists and scholars was really, really interesting. And I think that um, fieldwork and ethnography situate researchers among the community that they're researching, either as active participants or as observer or a combination of the two. Now, traveling to conflict zone offer researchers uh, an important opportunity to produce empirically rich research on militarized communities and so on. But living in a militarized environment for an extended period influences the research questions one might ask, the research one is able to conduct, and also affect the research process. Now, uh, as part of our reflection, we felt obligated to study these women because no one wants to hear what they have to say. They're not considered as heroes. They're not men. They're not um, building the meta-narrative of the state. And also, no one wants to hear about their traumas. And there, I, I brought only a few examples here, but there are many, many, many horror stories that I think that when you read it and when you bring it out to the open, that people will realize that armed conflict is not the best solution to, to conflicts and maybe perhaps trying to think about more peaceful solution by bringing all these stories um, to light. But at the same time, on the individual level, one of the things I think that came across in many of the narratives was uh, a positive view of the impact of their military service, the way in which, uh, you know, you know, that it led them to feel more empowered, that when they re-entered, if you like, civilian life, um, that it actually gave them a feeling of uh, empowerment and, and confidence. Um, did that 
did I wonder in, in, in hearing these narratives, did it change or surprise you in any way? Did you, uh, were there were things you heard in these stories that shifted your own understanding of, of um, the role of women in the IDF or in Israeli society more generally? I think that um, in a way, I wasn't surprised. I wasn't surprised. And um, it's really interesting to see that uh, the younger generation, I mean, the role of being a combatant was not open when Sheer, my co-author, and myself went into the army. We were both soldiers. It wasn't an option at all. And now when this option is open, then you understand that they're choosing this not because they're militarists or anything or they want to kill someone or they want to be, I don't know, in a war. They just, they see, okay, my brother can do that. I can do that too. I mean, this is the, the, the education that they get and they feel that they, they're capable. And I think it, make them, it makes them really uh, stronger and uh, they believe in their abilities. And sometimes the, the reality, I mean, in the reality, they, uh, they really resist the instances in which people are disregarding them or not appreciating enough their abilities. I mean, we have a lot of, um, a lot of instances in which the soldiers themselves emphasize with the, I, I, cho I chose to be there. I'm the best one for the job. I can do it better than anyone else. It was very, very strong. And also you can see that in their uh, afterlives, in the military afterlives, they see that sitting in discussions and they don't have um, much patience for sexual harassment. They don't have more patience to any of these comments whatsoever they become stronger. And uh, it was very, very clear. One of the, you, you mentioned in the book, uh, you provided the figure, I think from 2017, that at that point, 7%, uh, I believe, of women serving in the idea of serving combat roles. But you mentioned that the trend was increasing. And one of the things I thought was really interesting was the, the way in which you uh, redefine the, the understanding of combat, that because of the revolution in military affairs, the, the way in which the battlefield has now moved inside these control centers and become increasingly technological, um, has that, that process, in a sense, has allowed and enabled more women to enter into combat roles. Is that, is that correct? Yes, yes, indeed. I mean, this whole situation of new wars and the situation of handling the war, managing the war and the war and giving instructions from from the war rooms that are located on the borders, transfer the power to uh, mostly women that are sitting in war rooms and are starting to manage the war and also to protect the combatants that are inside the battlefield. So you have the soldiers in the battlefield protecting the country and all of those that are behind them, but also we have the war rooms that are protecting the soldiers inside. What it also do, it exposes all those soldiers that are sitting in the war rooms into the trauma of war because they also see even better than those who are in the battlefield. They see death, they see horror, they see terror attacks, they see many, many things. And I think that societies needs to be prepared to that and to, to try to comprehend these processes that these soldiers are going through and to take care of that while, you know, when they, they conclude the military service, no one is actually asking, how was it for you? How do you feel? And actually they admitted, all the interviewees said, listen, the stories that I'm telling to you, it's the first time that I'm telling this to anyone. And for us, it was it was surprising like nobody is interested in what they're going through for good and for worse. And I think it's a responsibility of the state and of the society that sends soldiers to these places to take care of these processes.
One, one uh, when you mentioned the, the uh, trauma that when we think about combat um, and military service in general, we often think about now the issue of uh, post-traumatic stress uh, disorder and the, the, the ways in which particularly uh, soldiers in combat can suffer from that. Has there been any study, I wonder, any, any data, although this is still early, in whether rates of PTSD differ between women in, uh, who have served in combat and men who have served in combat? And if so, why might there be a different uh, differential impact? Okay, so it's uh, really, it's really, really early. So it, there's not many, many studies about that. But what I can say is that historically, research on human-induced trauma and its aftermath began with Freud in response to combat distress of men combatants. And this research was later complemented by studies of the trauma of women and children as abused victims. Now, we need to understand that current knowledge about trauma stems from studies on combat men and victim women. And again, we're constructing another binary. Now, if um, our study is not quantitative, it's qualitative, so I can't give you data, but I certainly can tell from the stories of the soldiers that they're all experienced potential traumatic events. And I think that we need to move from the gender dichotomy and beyond the hero narratives of war and to explore narratives about things that happens in the battlefield. Making war, doing security involves with a lot of trauma. And I think that the, the, the ways in which the soldiers discuss this um, experiences and discuss these processes is in a way um, makes them feel better because it's, it entails the process of healing by talking. And we see many, many soldiers that see their friends dead, they see other dead, other people dead, and it, it's really traumatic. And I think that it's really, really important to, to hear what ails them and what, what are the processes. And also, what is very, very interesting to see, that most of the soldiers, both men and women, they experience trauma and then they move on with their lives. Now, it's like, this is what we expect from soldiers, right? But is it normal? Is it what we want to happen? I think, what do we want, you know, to achieve? And like, what are, are we really thinking about the soldiers and what's happening to them? So I think that in our book, we start to, I think the interview format, which enable women to process their traumatic experiences, has an empowering effect in so far as it enables them to recover their suppressed experiences. It's fascinating to so actually help shape them in some sense. I, I, a final question I, I have, because uh, I know we're, we're, we're running out of time. You, you, you present the book and the findings um, in, uh, in, in a comparative sense, holding up the experience of women in the IDF, in the combat in the IDF, as a template, as a possible template for a broader understanding of the role of uh, women in combat units, etc. Um, and, you know, there was occasions where you note during in the book that there may be some of the, uh, some aspects of women's experience in, the, in Israel in particular uh, differ. For example, uh, although sexual harassment of women in, in the IDF is widespread, as it is of, of women soldiers elsewhere, sexual assault rates were much lower. I wonder, is there anything unique about the experience of Israeli women in, in, uh, in the IDF? I mean, is there something different? Maybe the fact that Israel is this kind of long, on a long-term war footing, or that Israeli women have been serving in the IDF from, since Israel's establishment, and in fact, in the pre-state Zionist militias before that. Um, is there something, a, 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 along with the kind of universal or broader themes that your book emphasizes, is there something that was specific or, or, or very different about Israel in particular? While our study was not designed to empirically determine the scope of sexual harassment or sexual assault of women serving in combat and combat support roles, uh, we, we, we do know that earlier studies have found that women soldiers serving in the IDF 
uh, in more traditionally feminine roles, such as secretaries and administrators, suffer frequent sexual assault and harassment. And the masculine nature of the roles held by women in our study may partially account for this apparent difference, that is the smaller number of assault on women in combat. Um, now, but if this is the case, then it's worth asking why the US is different than are so many sexual assaults uh, in the military. So I think that, first of all, the lens of deployment is different. In Israel, the lens of deployment is three weeks, whether in America is a few months. And also another reason is that the military is mandatory, whereas in the US Army, it's a professional army in which factors such as social status, race and class of the recruited individuals also intervened. Uh, but we have to say that women in the military are confronted with both formal structure barriers and not formal structure barriers from various occlusion mechanisms that are difficult to expose and to change. Uh, what is mainly uh, from, from our findings that uh, if uh, uh, women in combat suffers from sexual harassment, then, you know, her automatic response is, shut up, sorry, I'll kill you. So it was really, I don't want to be rude, but this is like they disregard, they try to push them away, and in a way, uh, they succeeded. Um, I think more should be done in order to compare uh, other cases in which uh, sexual harassment and sexual assaults are more frequent, but uh, it's like we don't have much time for that. So I'm afraid we have run out of time, uh, Ayelet. I want to thank you for that really fascinating presentation and also for, for uh, writing such an uh, original and important uh, book about the experience of, of a population we, you know, that hasn't been discussed much in the field of security studies or in IR in general. I think it's in the, a contribution not only to, our, to Israel studies, but to these broader fields as well. I want to thank all of uh, the listeners and viewers uh, for joining us uh, today. Um, we will be having uh, more live webinars from the Nazarian Center for Israel Studies in the future. So uh, look out for those. Our next one will be in a, a couple of weeks time and we hope you will be able to join us for that. I wanna thank uh, Ayelet again for joining us today and for sharing her research with us uh, and uh, stay tuned till next time. Thank you very much. Bye.